Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you have had a million dollar sale? Crap. <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? Did you know that one of the largest sell killers in our industry starts with ownership? That's fact. And what is amazing in your communities, all of you have millionaires. That's a fact. And have you ever noticed that some of your clients walk in with really big jewelry? Large diamonds, killer timepieces, huge platinum bracelets. Where'd you get that? New York, Chicago, Hong Kong, on a cruise. And then some of them bring their cruise jewelry in and they ask you, did I get a good deal? And the diamonds are faster than sand they picked up off a beach. <laughs> and the gold, we won't talk about the gold. They do it to you all the time. And one of the amazing problems in our industry is owners have something called poverty level mentality. Big problem. Oh, we, we don't sell big diamonds, Shane. Well, one reason is because your thought process is that you've already told yourself you don't sell large diamonds. I'm going to see if I can shut this off somehow. I'm getting feedback. The other problem is you don't stock it. And the other problem is you don't think that your clients would ever buy anything like that. Poverty level mentality. And then we have salespeople, and the average salesperson right now in the United States is writing two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year in sales, and that's their total sales. I was at one of my accounts this week. Uh, I have over a dozen accounts that have writers writing three point five million a year sales associates that I've been training for a long time. But that's a pretty good book, isn't it? Uh, they're selling more than most average jewelry stores by themselves produce in an entire year. Part of it's thought process, part of it's follow-up, part of it is know-how to clientele and work in the right circles. And then we have another sell killer that owners and managers and salespeople commit. And on their approach, when somebody comes in, they're thinking, ah, they never buy anything. Oh man, this is a waste of time. Look what they're driving. Look how they're dressed. Did you see their car? Geez, I got stuff to do. I got to make a Pandora order. <laughs> Sorry. <That was> good. <laughs> I got to order some $30 beads. And so on your approach, mentally you've already killed the sale because you already told yourself they never buy anything or they can't afford it. Yet, all of you have millionaires, go ahead. <laughs> all of you have millionaires that walk in every day. And then you've got the people that walk in and dress like they have a lot of money that don't have much. And then the ones that don't have much money or look like they have much money have a whole lot of money. It's a game people play and they play it everywhere. About three weeks ago, or four, I lose track of time. I've flown all over the United States in the last four weeks. A gentleman came in, high-end jewelry store that I was doing some training in. Had on kind of old-looking boots, Carhartt pants, and a Carhartt coat with big pockets. And was standing there and pulled out a Ziploc freezer bag of gold. About a pound about a pound. His wife, and he had been collected for about 40 years, herringbone chains, class rings, old wedding bands, all kinds of stuff, about a pound. And of course, everybody that brings in gold needs gas money and they're hungry, right? And we choose who we want to wow, and you should wow everybody, but we choose that also. 
And a young man came in, pulled up in a fairly nice car, had on his slacks, his white shirt and tie, waiting for a battery. And I just got done doing a presentation in this store. And man, they were showing this young guy in the white shirt and a tie. He had a gorgeous diamond in his hand. And they found out he'd been unemployed for two years. I went out to work with another employee and, uh, on some one-on-one -on -one sales training that I do and uh, the gentleman with the bag of gold, because I always wear black suits and white shirts, he says, excuse me, but do you work here? And I said, no, but I'll be glad to help you with anything. And I said, I'm a friend of the family. And he said, well, can I see one of those? See, the guy waiting for the battery had the diamond in his hand and the Guy in the shabby clothes with a pound of gold, uh, didn't have anything in his hand but a pound of gold. <laughs> and so I got a sales associate to start talking to him, and they found out that he was a surgeon at the hospital. But uh, they'd had kind of a cruddy winter, and it was his day off, and he was raking the leaves up and cleaning up his yard and making it look nice for spring. And uh, on the way to the jewelry store, he, had, he was on his way to the hardware store to get something. His wife said, you're going right by the jewelry store, take in that bag of gold. And so in the process of all of this, he traded the gold in for a large diamond, and the guy waiting for the battery, he'd been unemployed for two years, couldn't hardly pay for the battery. And the guy buying the diamond, trading the gold in, could have bought the jewelry store's building, all the inventory, out of petty cash. But you see what we do. Assuming is a major cell killer. Poverty level mentality is a major cell killer. And when you go to an automobile dealership and it's a little, a little lot and they've got a couple of acres of cars and they've got two or three hundred cars, they're going to sell two or three hundred cars a year. And in your cities and in your areas, there's the automobile dealers that has a thousand acres and he's got a thousand cars and he's going to sell a thousand cars. If you have a little inventory, you sell a little. If you have a lot of inventory, you sell a lot. Inventory will obviously control a lot of your volume. Now, I want you to be smart with it, but you guys, if you don't have diamonds or large diamonds, you're not going to sell any. This year, one of my accounts sold an 11 carat Paraiba. Uh, their research, not mine, their research found out that it was the fifth largest one found in the world in the last couple of years, I guess. And that's what they told me, but it was 1.1 million. An 11 carat Paraiba. Now, do you know why they sold it? I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Another one of my accounts sold a million dollar diamond this year. Another one sold a two million dollar diamond. And this is April? A two million dollar diamond. Oh, uh, the million dollar diamond was sold in a store in Arkansas. <laughs> Arkansas. And the amazing thing is how we think. you got to change how you think. People in all of your towns, they buy Bentleys, Mercedes, Platinum Rolexes, ski in, ski out homes in Colorado. They have yachts. And they buy their big jewelry when they travel because, you know, you guys are a great place to get things repaired. Oh, uh, you know, it's a great place to get things repaired, but if you want to buy big jewelry, you've got to go to New York, Chicago. How many times have you heard, oh, we get all repairs done with you, uh, but uh, the big stuff, and you've all heard it, have you not? Change how they think. And you've got to change how you think and how you sell. And that doesn't mean that you go buy million-dollar diamonds. There's a lot of ways to create the sell and have it sent to you. A $5,000 sale is easier to close than a $1,000 one. In fact, the $1,000 sale is one of your hardest ones because the guy's going, dang, $1,000, my credit cards are maxed out. Cards are maxed out. I got a little bit in the checkbook. Wife got that. I got 20 bucks. That's $1,000. Hmm. Now, a $5,000 sale is easier to close than a thousand. A ten thousand is easier than five. A hundred thousand dollar sale, the average hundred thousand dollar sale in our industry takes fifteen minutes. You know how hard you work for a two thousand dollar one? It's unbelievable. Now the reason the hundred thousand and the half a million, the million dollar sales are so easy, it's because they can. And it's because they have the money. And it, because for them, it's just a decision. It goes like this. Honey, do you want it? Yeah. 
Are you going to wear it? Yeah. You really think you love it? Yeah. Okay, let's get it. Okay. They give you a Black American Express. Bam! And what's amazing is uh, you're going, <laughs> you're kidding, right? Or if you do sell a hundred thousand dollars, yeah, don't, 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 don't ever do that in front of a client. <laughs> They're not going to think you've ever been there before. And then when somebody does a really awesome sell that's never done one, you're so bad, nobody can stand you the rest of the day. I'm so bad, man. I'm so bad. I'm so bad. Nobody can stand you. I can't stand you either, but I mean, it's nice you did it. So what does it take? First of all, those clients buy on impulse. Did you know that? All of you have bought on impulse. Some of you have bought on impulse at Walmart. Have you ever been to Walmart? I was there one time. I thought I was at the filming of Deliverance. <laughs> that place is unbelievable. They said America shops there, and I didn't see any. <laughs> but it's Walmart, and people buy on impulse there. They passed Tiffany's two years ago in jewelry sales as America's number one jewelry seller. And if you were to go to Sam's Club's or Walmart's webpage or Sam Club and look at their loose diamond inventory that they own, it'll blow you away. You have a lot of competition. And the thing about it is, is we've got to be awesome at working with the clientele that can afford it. And that takes civic work. It takes people skills. Common sense. Knowing how to close. Knowing how to sell on impulse. And looking at your past sales of people that have bought three carats, four carats, five carats, a lot of those want to trade them in for bigger and better. Just because they bought a three carat doesn't mean that that's done. Everybody that is in the industry of loving diamonds and selling diamonds and buying diamonds, approximately 20% of the income brackets in our country are jewelry buyers. And that's fact. And the jewelry buying cycle does not start when you get engaged. And there are a lot of people that say, oh, my wife doesn't buy jewelry, I don't buy jewelry, and they have a Timex watch, got a wedding band, maybe a gold chain, and that's it. But there's also something called the jewelry buying cycle, and that usually starts at the age of around 45-ish. Now that's when their house is paid for, their kids are out of college, wife goes back to work, and there are people that love coming in that are good every year for a little pop and a big pop. And you know who they are. If you've been selling very long, they come in every year. And the little pop might be Valentine's Day or Christmas, and the big pop might be anniversary. So you've got people that start what's called their jewelry buying cycle. And one of the cool things about this is they will tell 10 people, goes like this, uh, where'd you get that tennis bracelet? Oh, my husband got it for me for our 25th anniversary. He got it from such and such jewelers. And they start bragging about you. Now, what is amazing if you walk somebody, you didn't close it the day they start their jewelry buying cycle, and you walked them for 20 years, you just didn't walk them. You see, when you're in your jewelry buying cycle, that family or person or whoever's in it, in that 20 years, will get you 10 loyalists. Those are people that will shop with you every year, all the time. Those 10 get 10 in the 20 years. If you walk somebody the day they start their jewelry buying cycle, you walked 110 clients, and it's also estimated you walked a minimum, not counting referral sales, of $500,000 volume in 20 years because you didn't close it. Now, what is interesting about large ticket sales? When somebody sees a two carat on somebody's hand or a three and they're at the country club or they're eating out or wherever they're at, where'd you get that? Man, that's awesome. Where'd you get those four carat total weight studs? Because ladies that are fashionable and men that like buying their wives diamonds, they notice other people that are wearing large jewelry. Is that a fact? All right, time out. We're not going any further for a moment. Let me see the hands of those of you in this room that have been in the jewelry industry over five years. Thank you. Keep them up. Keep them up. How many of you have on a two carat? <laughs> now, we're supposed to be... You can put it down now. Yellow Unless you, you want to put them both up, that'll work too. Yellow or white? 
Yellow or white? She has both. Now here's what's interesting. The wealthy come in and they look at your hands. I have lawnmower mechanics I've worked with that wears more jewelry than this man does sitting on the front row. That's it. No, he's got on a little ringy. And so the wealthy come in and they're looking at your hands, your ears. And ladies, you guys are, you, you, you're the fashion models in the jewelry stores. You got to put it on. You got to wear the studs and the inline diamond bracelet and the big pendants because they look at your hands. You're the first representation that they see. They see you out. But you see, when you sell big pieces and the wealthier at the country club, they go, where'd you get that? Oh, I got it from such and such jewelers. Now you're starting to get what's called jewelry momentum just from wearing it or having your pieces sold on somebody else where the rich go and the rich see it. Now listen to this. The average closing ratio right now in mall stores, I'm going to talk about closes, I got a presentation that's all on closing the sale, is 8%. In independently owned jewelry stores that are attached to other buildings, it's 23 to 27. And freestanding jewelry stores that have their own parking lot, uh, their closing ratios are around 33 to 35%, depending on also if they're branded, it goes up. When you're working with the wealthy, people making over 150, 200,000 a year, the millionaires, closing ratio with them, goes up over 50%. Did you hear that? First of all, because they can afford it. All right? Number two, because they can. Number three, because they want it. Number four, because it's a decision. And number five, you have it. If it's a referral from a wealthy client, they see a large diamond on somebody at the country club and they're eating out and they go, where'd you get that? No, I got that at such and such jewelers. And they come in and they want to start talking to you about it. The closing ratio on the six and seven digit year wage earners from a referral, from a referral, never been in before, but a referral sends them in, it is over 90%. <coughs> National closing ratio when they walk in is 23. Closing ratio on wealthy when they come in from a referral is over 90%. But you see, most of us, they see Melly on everybody's hand. Melly is 99 points and down. <laughs> and you guys wear Melly. Can you imagine owning a store wearing Melly? Those are nice little itty bitty diamonds you got on. So, you got to represent your product. You got to get people representing your product that are seen in civic groups and at the country club in the right spaces and places because that gives you incredible referral momentum. What is amazing also is when it only takes 15 minutes to close a ticket that's $100,000 or more because for them all it is is a decision. We got to think about memos, having a museum case where there's one item in the case and a lights on it, wowing people with it. Now, you got to wow smart. Always while smart. You gotta while smart. If they're not wearing jewelry, you can while with a carrot. If they got on a carrot, you show them a two. If they got on a lot of large jewelry, you while large. You got to while smart. Because sometimes accidentally wowing, if uh, they're not wearing jewelry, you can actually intimidate somebody with a while because, oh geez, I can never buy something that's 50,000 or 100,000 or whatever. So you got to while smart. That means, and you're not, I'm not giving you permission to prejudge, but you've got to be extremely observant and listening to the clues they give you on what they can or can't or have or have not bought. You've got to be extremely observant in your presentation. So, if you've got people who have sold, bought three carrots, fours or fives from you, guess what? They're a potential million dollar sell. Or maybe they're a six or seven or a ten carat sell. And you know diamonds went up 30% last year and I've got an account wanting a two and a half and I just had a call this morning on a VS1F 2.5 triple zero cost on it $72,000. Cost on a two and a half carat. <coughs> a two and a half. That's not a big diamond. Well, if you don't sell many, it might seem like it is, but that's not a big diamond, people. 
So you cannot have sticker shock if you haven't bought larger ones for a while, understanding how much they went up last year, and you can't act like when you're talking to a vendor or a client that they're a lot of money. It's just got to be as if you're selling anything else. Price creates fear, not in the buyer, in the seller. And another problem is when you're showing high ticket items or selling something that's a hundred or a half a million or a million, here's what salespeople do. It's amazing. What we try to do is we try to justify or apologize for the price. And if you do a justification presentation on price or you're trying to apologize for the price, what you're actually doing is making the client feel like what you're showing them, you think it's a lot of money. There can never be any justification or apologizing for the price. <clears throat> and when you're selling high ticket items, here's how you say the price, it's 1.2. You look them square in the eye and you tell them it's 1.2 million. You don't say it's 1.2 million dollars, that sounds like a lot and it is, but I mean that's what it is and that's how I needed to say it. It's just 1.2. And the, the, the interesting thing is when you're talking to people that have money, they know exactly what it is. 127,950 is $127,950. Say it correctly when you're working with these types of clients. And when you say it, look them square in the eye. And when you're showing a high ticket item, when you say the price, this is extremely important. Make sure the item you're selling is in the client's hand. Psychologically, if you have a hold of the item and you say the price to them, but you have it, your body language is telling that client they can't afford it. Always make sure they have it in their hand when you say the price. Look them square in the eye when you say the price. Don't beat around the bush. I have an account in Hawaii, and we go there every year. Our youngest son, JT, he's 11. He's been there five years in a row, and we stay at the Grand Wailea Resort. And my wife said, Shane, I, I want to go on a dress-up date. And this is just last fall. And when I'm dressed up, I have on crunchy starch jeans, awesome western boots, killer hat, and nice shirt. And Emily meant dressed-up date suit dressed up date. <laughs> and so JT and I were getting our suits on and my wife had on a three carat on one hand, a two on another, I think a three around the neck, a ten carat triple zero platinum inline diamond bracelet, Rolex, four carats total weight. She had on about a quarter of a million dollars in jewelry. When you've been doing this 40 years you collect some, isn't that right? <laughs> Actually she's been the collector. I've been the spender, that's how that goes, isn't it? <laughs> How that goes? And she had on high heels. My wife's very tall, so I have to wear high shoes because with her heels on, she's like six foot. And uh, so I just, I got to be a little taller than her, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, she didn't have on running shoes. And the reason she didn't have on running shoes, she always said, Shane, if we're ever going to steal something, I don't want to do it in front of JT because we always wanted to model and lead by the right thing. So she had on high heels. You got it? We walked in Tiffany's, in the Wailea shops, and they had their security guard by the front door, had on a tight shirt, showing his muscles, giving us the dirty, <laughs> rocking. So I gave him the dirty back. <laughs> no smiles, no hellos at Tiffany's that day, imagine that. They had a Paraiba tourmaline in there, about five carats, Caribbean ocean water blue, drop dead gorgeous Paraiba, and no smiles, no hellos. My wife walked up to the lady that was behind the Paraiba tourmaline case, and I guess they practice in their uh, certain areas called departmentalized salesmanship. You can only sell in your own department, you can't get out. So my wife walked up to the lady in the department. My wife said, I'd like to see that Paraiba. The young lady at Tiffany said, it's a lot of money. <laughs> hmm. My wife said, I'd like to see it. With a disgusted look on her face, because she had to unlock a case, and bend over and grab something. And they weren't doing anything when we came in, so I'm sure this was a huge irritation, because... <laughs> She is one of those that wanted to look busy when she wasn't busy, so she didn't have to be busy when she didn't really want anything to do. So my wife was an irritant. She reached in the case, 
grabbed the Periba tourmaline ring, the young lady put it on her index finger, locked it with her thumb, and said, see it and put it up. No. <laughs> Fired! <laughs> That's what I'd have done! On the way, yeah, you about jumped out of your skin, young lady. <laughs> You're awake now, aren't you? Drink some more coffee. I mean, I tell you what, she left her shoes and her skin right in the sheet there. <laughs> On the way out, JT, he's 10 years old at that time, goes, Dad, she wasn't very friendly, was she? <laughs> he's 10 years old. Now, you want to know why their online sales are more than what they take out of their actual case and sell? Would you like to know why? Walk in one someday. Did my wife look like she couldn't afford it? But does it have anything to do with prejudging, attitude? So, salesmanship, the definition, is your ability to create the desire to get your client to want the product. So you got to wow smart. Have museum pieces in. Have large tickets memoed in. And when rich come in, at least let them know you have it. Whether they buy it or not, they know you have it. Then when they get ready to want one, who are they going to contact? Especially if you got that in their hand and you made them feel special because they're holding something that's drop dead gorgeous and large and they've never maybe done it before in your community. Oh, they've done it before. They've been to Winston and Graff and all kinds of places. But now you have it. Their mindset just changed about who you are, what you have, and what you can do. Huge change. You got to change your client's mindset. Highly educated and extremely wealthy, they're spoiled. They love attention. They love incredible professionalism. And one of the things, if you want to sell large ticket items, is you've got to have an incredible amount of product knowledge of the item you want to sell. You've got to have gemological knowledge also. Right now, you don't even have to go to GIA. There's enough information on the internet that you can, right now, go to GIA and pass the Diamond 1 and Diamond 2 test. Not the grading part, but written, Diamonds 1 and 2, you have people, if they research it enough, can go right to GIA and pass the test. If you sell high-end timepieces, you got to know about the product. And something that you need to use is a tool called value-added statements. Value-added statements is a tool that you use that allows you to romance money without ever talking about the money. People come in and they'll go, man, platinum, platinum mountings are a lot of money. I mean, that's $2,750 without any diamonds. That's... 4,700 without any diamonds. And you can come back and say, did you realize that it takes anywhere from 8 to 10 tons of the earth's crust removed of platinum ore to find one troy ounce of platinum? 10 tons would be 10 one-ton dump truck loads full of the earth's crust to find an ounce of it. Now, would you like to tell me how we can sell that for $4,700? So one of the things that you guys have to do is you've got to have value-added statements. Value-added statements are facts that drive up the perceived value in the client's mind. Another problem we have, and you guys have not done a good job of doing this, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm telling you this, but everybody thinks jewelers have high markups. Did you know they know all of you are a millionaire? They know it. In fact, you might as well be got all those diamonds, you might as well be a millionaire. Why don't you mark it up more so, I mean, you, at least what they assume about us is correct. I mean, you ought to have so much money, you got to take it home in your trunk and your Cadillac every night, right? <laughs> hey, while we're talking about Cadillacs, how many of you in here drive BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, Cadillacs, uh, Corvettes, anything like that? Let me see the hands of those drivers. All right, how many of you that have your hands up have on a two-carat? Watch, why, why is your car more important than your business? Sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> and so, there are value-added statements on high-end timepieces. It takes a year to build a Rolex president. How can a ever-read, 
president, meteorite diamond dial. How can you sell that for $42,950? And the meteorite really is a meteorite. It really is from out of the world. And they slice it so thin. Gosh, that's drop dead gorgeous. I'd be showing them to everybody that came in. How can you sell that for $42,950? And then they want you to negotiate it because you guys don't even believe in the prices. So, value added statement. So I got a challenge for all of you. When you go back home, I would like for you to have you, your managers, all your salespeople, give each one a different product and have them write 20 value added statements on every brand and every product that you have. Because what that does is it drives up the perceived value in the client's mind and you don't have to romance it as much and it reduces the price objections when you get to the price. Let's talk about million dollar diamonds, okay? Now you guys all have studied GIA and you know that GIA tells us and you know that De Beers tells us and I've done consulting before for De Beers in London and we know that they tell us that it takes one million gym quality diamonds mine to obtain one one carat. That's what they tell us. In fact, I've got a book right here in my case. I can show it to you from De Beers. Facts. A million of them. Now 80% of the diamonds that come out of the earth's crust are bort. Industrial grade. GIA the Supreme Court in our industry that sets standards that jewelers follow worldwide tell us that gym quality diamonds are from flawless to I3 and I have a hard time calling an I3 that looks like frozen spit gym quality but I'm not going to argue with the Supreme Court so that's just the way that is. <laughs> now, it takes a million diamonds gym quality mined. That's a thousand piles of diamonds with a thousand diamonds in each pile. One will weigh a carat. Why do you negotiate the prices of a carrot when it's $69.50, $79.50? How can you even sell it for $79.50? And then they want to negotiate it, and you don't know how to sell it without negotiating, so you use negotiation as a cheap cop-out to close it because you don't believe in the price either. What do you think a wealthy person's going to think on a million-dollar one? If you don't know how to use value-added statements. They tell us it takes five million diamonds mined to obtain a two carat. That's the best value right now in the diamond industry because they're not five times more than a one. You guys should have all kinds of two carats in your inventory. Oh, gee, Shane, I can't afford it. There you go again, sitting there with your poverty level mentality staring at me right now. You can't afford not to. That's the problem. Poverty level mentality is a major cell killer, and you create it. I don't know the odds on a three, but I can tell you that a natural, fancy, intense colored diamond, natural, fancy, intense colored diamond, happen once every 10,000 times in nature. It happens once every 10,000 times. Now, they mine a million diamonds to get a one carat. They mine 10,000 one carats to get one colored one. What is 10,000 times a million? Come on. Ask Obama. Ask Obama. <laughs> <laughs> it's a billion. A billion diamonds to get a natural, fancy, intense color. Now one of my accounts in Oregon not too long ago just sold a natural, fancy, intense, saturated pink, VS1, two matching lab reports for $1,100,000. Now I'd like to know how you can sell something for $1,100,000 and it took a billion to find it. Huh? Did they negotiate it? Not a nickel. A young lady bought it, she was in her early 30s, pulled up in a white Tahoe, had her hair in a ponytail, blue jeans, I was in the store, uh, had on tennis shoes and an old sweatshirt, and she wrote a check. And she called and asked her husband, she said, do we have enough money to check an account? That's a great phone call. <laughs> Can you imagine it? Honey, do we have $1.1 million in our checking account? 
Now, do you want to know why she bought it? Because she, oh, because she could? Because she could. I want to ask you a question. Was it a lot of money? Was it a lot of money? No. If anybody in here shakes your head up and down, there's the door. It wasn't. No poverty level mentality. They just had it memoed in to show people. It was in the museum case. Oh, did I tell you that she went in to get a battery put in her watch? That's all. And they handed it to her. They threw in the battery. <laughs> they, they let her have it. They did that for free. She's wearing it too. They made her a mounting. Wearing it. So, you got to have the inventory. You got to do the civic work. You got to have your product seen where the wealthy people are hanging out. And you do have people in your towns that buy Bentleys and ski and ski out homes and they buy boats and they buy yachts. And you got to work on having no prejudging going on in your store all the time. Everybody should be wowed. Biggest miss sell. Now, some of the things that you got to do just to sell a million dollars in a year, all right? Just to sell a million, not have a million dollar sale. You got to be awesome at romancing the product. And that takes two knowledges. It takes product knowledge and gemological. You got to be awesome at romancing the product. And in a presentation, romancing is usually 70 to 80% of your presentation time. And there's three things romanced. There's the beauty of the item. And what is amazing to me is you guys hire new people that have never sold jewelry. Most of you set them up to fail, but you hire new people. And then you got the people that have been in your store selling for you 10, 15 years, selling three to 500,000, not much, but that's what they're selling. And your new person comes in with all this enthusiasm and she's setting up the diamonds. Wow, look at that. Is that a real? Oh, I got to have one of those. And man, they're trying on a carrot and half, they're playing in the jewelry, and the veteran's going, just put the crap out. It's just a diamond. And I write articles for in-store about wowing. And people email me back and they go, Shane, nothing wows me anymore. And I email them back. Is it about you? <laughs> Who's it about? Crap, we put it out every morning. We put it away every night. Put it out every morning. Put it. Why don't you just leave it out? <laughs> Why don't you just leave it put up, and if somebody wants something, you'll go get it. That's better. Don't got to pay everybody to put your crap out every morning. So your veterans, they get desensitized and jaded. And we don't want to self-improve anymore. Well, I don't need GIA. Really? I don't need to do Diamonds 1 and 2. I sell some. Really? My record's 16 in one day over a carrot. That's my record. That's how many I've sold in one day over a carrot. Got to happen. Didn't have a sale. Wasn't an event. Just people been wild for seven years and it was a weird moon. I think a werewolf is out and sucked all their blood out. That's what I think. <laughs> but anyway, you got to change your veteran's attitude about the product. And a lot of you have people working for you and it's just a job. I don't need that. I need a professional career person wanting to take care of every client and giving them an experience they'll never forget. That's the level you got to take this to to sell a million a year. So the first thing you romance is the beauty. Second, you romance value-added statements. Oh, that's where that comes in, getting the perceived value to go up, giving them facts about the product without ever talking about money. Third thing you romance, clients give you something called trigger words. And they'll come in and they'll say, my wife's always dreamed of. It's our 30th anniversary. We just had our fourth baby. Just because. Christmas, Hanukkah, and you got the doghouse key getter outer. You do. Men do this. Women don't do this. I've never had a lady walk in a jewelry store and go, I'm in trouble. Men, and when they come in and go, oh, I'm in trouble, you always think they did the big nasty. <laughs> now, most of the time they didn't. Sometimes we won't go there. 
But my best get you out of the doghouse ever in my life, and if you've heard this story before, I apologize for you hearing it again, but it's an awesome story. This guy came in, it was a hot day, and he had on Harley boots, Harley pants, Harley coat, Darth Vader hat. I didn't know it was John until he took his helmet off. Brand new, authoritative, loud, rumbling Harley sitting in front of the store, and he walks in and he goes, Shane, I can't go home. That's bad. You can't go home. No, I can't go home. What'd you do? Now, let me tell you what we do in our industry. When somebody says they're in the doghouse, can't go home, in our industry, because we work with feelings and emotions, you always ask them, because you practice psychology, what'd you do? And you base how much they have to spend on how bad their bad was. <laughs> Is that not fact? Yeah, it's fact. Mm -hmm. And so, he goes, Shane, my buddies came by this morning, said, John, you want to go to the Harley shop? I said, yes. My wife said, you can have a coach, you can do this, you can do that. But when we got married, she said, over my dead body, will you ever have a Harley? On the way out the door, the last thing she said is, you know the rules, boy. I uh, bought one. <laughs> How much was it? Well, with the pipes, the carburetors, and all the chrome, my suit. <laughs> Had to have a Harley suit. $30,000. And I said, well, that'll get your wife a nice little something. Oh, that's why I'm here. I want to get her a little something. I said, you don't understand. Now, to give you an idea how long ago this was, that was a Lazar Kaplan two-carat center, a Lazar Kaplan carat on each side, four-carat total weight, J-Bell dice truck ring in 18-carat and white, and it was $32,950. Now, that ring today would be $90, would it not? But anyway, I said, it's $32,950. And he goes, what? He said, Shane. I wouldn't plan on spending $60,000 in one day. And I said, John, that's not my problem. I didn't buy the Harley. <laughs> and guess what he bought? And he said, I know how I'm going to get home. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to get going really fast, pulling the clutch and shut it off and coast. <laughs> then what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll figure that out when I get there. But I never did get the ring back. The reason, the 30th anniversary. Last fall, I was in a jewelry store that was one of my accounts that sells Rolexes, and all our military guys that I see in the airport, and I fly 50 Mondays a year somewhere. 50. And uh, all the military young ladies and men that I see in the airport, all of them, I walk up, shake their hand, pat them on the back, tell them how much I appreciate what they do. I have got a collection of stuff in my briefcase that they've given me. One gave me a patch off his shoulder from the Hella Division. I got Marine Corps stickers, Air Force stickers, and I keep them in my Bible just to remind me to pray for those guys. But are they not awesome? I'm not kidding. And you never interrupt in the middle of a presentation ever. It's rude, unless you're the manager and your salespeople are not closing, and you know that you can walk in and help them close, owners and managers, you can walk in uninvited anytime you need to. Salespeople, don't ever interrupt salespeople. Yeah, but I waited on her two weeks ago. I don't care if you waited on her five minutes ago and they came back in and didn't ask for you. How's that? And this couple was there, they're about my age, and they were talking about their daughter coming home from their fourth tour her fourth tour in Afghanistan, they were looking at a stainless steel Rolex, and I just walked up and I said, excuse me for interrupting. And I don't mean to be rude, but I want to thank your, uh, tell your daughter thank you very much, and I want to thank your hands. And she kind of welled up in her eyes, and he said, honey, he said, we got to get her a gold Rolex. I never mentioned anything about the Rolex. But if you're awesome at romancing the reason they came in, the reason. The birth of the baby, Afghanistan, 30th anniversary. And you make the reason a bigger deal than the client thought it was because you were listening to why they're in here. Everybody comes in jewelry stores for a reason. We don't sell tires. And the reason's personal. And you romance the reason right before you discuss the price. Again, the price just became insignificant and the closing ratio goes up. Price doesn't matter anymore. 
Sometimes they'll upsell themselves just like they did from the stainless to the gold Rolex. It's amazing. So you've got to learn how to romance money without talking about it to drive the perceived value up. You've got to learn how to romance the reason right before you to discuss the price to make the money not even important anymore. So wealthy people expect us to be educated. They expect your salespeople to be educated and owners, those of you that have salespeople in here, to allow them not to do GIA diamonds one and two, at least diamonds, you're setting them up to fail. Why just diamonds? Well, last year in the United States, 63% of all jewelry sold was diamond something. Colored stones fell to 6%, just so you know. Do people still buy color? Yeah, a little bit, but not like they did 30, 40 years ago. When I started in the industry, half of what we sold was color. Not anymore. It fell to 6%. We are a diamond timepiece, gold and platinum country. That's what we're turning into. It's fat. So, you got to know about diamonds. You've got to have sales meetings to teach people how to close. And the biggest sell killer on high ticket items that are 100,000, 500,000, or a million is we do not know how to close $10,000 sales. How are you going to close a $100,000 one? And nothing's different but the zeros. And the level of the professionalism of the person standing on the other side of the case. You got to know how to close. 60% of all people that come in your store can't make up their own mind. All they want is a little reassurance it's okay to spend the money. That's really all they want. And the closing isn't the ending, it's what you do at the beginning. As I said, we're going to talk about that later. But one of the secrets on high ticket sales is knowing how to close. Whether it's impulse, or a planned buy, or an anniversary, or just because, whatever the reason is, you got to know how to close it. You got to know how to romance it. Now, Proactive salesmanship. How many of your clients, let me rephrase this, how many of you send out thank you cards on every sales slip? 10%. Why don't the rest of you? You should send them out on everybody coming in to get a battery put in a timepiece, every repair picked up. You should send them out to every client that came in that you didn't close. And in your conversation with relationship and selling specific questions, which we will talk about in another presentation, you have enough information, you know their name, where they work, email address, and you can thank them for coming in. Just send them an email, thank them for coming in, and maybe uh, send them a thank you card, thanking them for giving you the opportunity to show them something gorgeous. But you see... A lot of you, you wait on somebody and they leave empty handed and you don't even know who the crap you just waited on. What was their name? I don't know. What do they do? I don't know. Where are they from? I don't know. Well, what were they looking at? One carrot? Why didn't you close it? I don't know. Are they coming back? No. Proactive salesmanship. You got to gather enough information that you can follow up with everybody that came in you didn't close, so you can send them a card, follow it up with an email or text or phone call. What is amazing is I got an account in Pennsylvania uh, on uh, close to the East Coast, and they have one store, and they uh, did a six-month interview of their clients that were picking up a repair. And they said, how do you want to be contacted? Text, email, or phone call? Over 50% said, text me. 50%. That's interesting. Yes? Is it appropriate to write a thank you note in any of those fashions, or should you still handwrite a thank you note if they, if they purchase? Don't print from a computer. No, no, no. Handwrite them all. Handwrite them. Yes. Not email or text. No, all purchases is a handwritten okay. thank you card. And people say, my writing's sloppy. Well, write neat. <laughs> <laughs> all right? I don't like my writing that he can't read it. You know, that's a choice, and that's a crappy cop-out. Write neat. Write neat. Lewis. <laughs> so, you do proper follow-up. 
Then you do six months follow up and somebody buys a beautiful diamond or a tennis bracelet or a high end, if we can say that, piece of jewelry. Call them in six months. Mrs. Jones, this is Shane at Decker Diamond Company and six months ago today you got a gorgeous diamond ring from us and we want to polish it, check it, make sure it's tight. Obviously, you know the service is free. Uh, when you come in, well, I can come in on Wednesday. Do you prefer morning or afternoon? Afternoon's great. What time? Two o'clock. What kind of coffee do you like? I love mocha frappuccinos. I'll have one waiting here for you at two o'clock. <laughs> Now, while it's in the shop and we're making sure it's tight and we're cleaning and polishing her three carat VS1F triple zero she purchased, guess what we're showing her? Our new lithium watch batteries. Is that what we're doing? Or do we know that she loves large diamonds and now we're showing her the studs that match, the pendant that match, uh, the inline diamond bracelet that matches, but guess what? This is how you build people that become habit clients and they're in their 20 year buying cycle. Now here's what's cool about the 20 year buying cycle and this is a point that's very important. Are you ready? Almost every large purchase, not the little pop they come in for every year, but almost every large purchase the next year is larger than the last year's. And then the next year's is larger. And then the next year is larger. Then the next year is larger. And all of a sudden you're selling a hundred thousand dollar item. Then a one fifty. Then a two fifty. Then a half a million. Why? Because you are building a relationship with a person that can afford it and they give you information and you have to be the keeper of secrets. You gotta be the keeper of secrets. You see, we sell life, memories, just because, sentiment, never forget, longer than life, generational, love, and we're the keeper of secrets. So are you going to be the ordinary jeweler that's in your town that uh, changes a lot of batteries, which I want you to do because I want them wild, and you just do a lot of repairs, which I want you to do because I want them wild, and we're not good at follow-up and proactive salesmanship and we have salespeople that are irritated to put the diamonds out every day and uh, we have salespeople that don't like approach a customer. Oh, they're coming, in for, they're coming in for a repair. I see it. Hide, hide. Let the new kid catch him. Hide. Act like you're on the phone. Boy, dodge that bullet. How's she going? You know why repair clients are coming in? Because they trust you. Huge compliment. So who are you going to be? You going to be the Mallee store or you going to be the big diamond store? Who are you going to be? Change your thinking. And then there's the other proactive salesmanship on repairs. And a whole lot of wealthy people that don't buy your jewelry from you, they have you repair it for them because they trust you. Now, you call them up after the repairs picked up. Mrs. Jones, this is Shane at Decker Diamond Jewelers. And I just wanted to make sure the repair we did for you a couple of weeks ago, the ring's fitting okay. You don't have to call me back. I would just call and make sure. Now, here's what's weird. They always call you back. Man, I can't believe you called me back. It's awesome. Now, when they understand that you start having awesome service and you care about their repair business that much and the things to them that are little things, what do you think they're going to think about you when it comes to big tickets if you start wowing them with them? when they come in. You see, they're going to test you with service first. They're going to test you. Before they buy big ticket items, they're going to test you. Now, wealthy person leaves their ring to be repaired. We called her, told her she's ready to come in, pick it up. Her name's Mrs. Jones. And uh, she comes in. And you go to the J's, Jones. Excuse me a second. Did you say Jones or Bones? <laughs> hey, Mikey. Mikey. Mikey! Go check the jeweler's desk and see if Mrs. Jones' repairs back there. <laughs> hey, Brenda, you go through the A's, through the J's, and I'll go through the rest of them. <laughs> I will find it. <laughs> Are you sure you left it here? Can you imagine taking your BMW to get the oil changed and they can't find your car? Huh? Have you ever had to look for repairs? How hard is it to put it where it goes? Tell me. How hard is it to put it where it goes? And they're rich. Are they buying anything from you? No. Sell killers. You commit them all the time. Professionalism is obviously what's seen 
in your operational, organizational skill set. And I walk in jewelry stores all the time. I've trained in 4,000. And there's crap all over the counters. And there's notepads. And there's cards. And there's all sorts of stuff. And there's charms on a thing spinning around and around. And you haven't sold one out of there since 1972. And Spadell watch bands you spend all around. And you put your bead case by where everybody stops. Where everybody stops, I'd have my diamond case. What do they see? Do we look rich? Or do we look like a repair stop? Look at your stores. They've got to look awesome. Wealthy will prejudge you before you prejudge them, walking in and go, well, we can get it repaired here, but we can't buy anything here that fast. You've got to exceed their expectations on everything you do, even from appearance. Some of you need to remodel your stores. Yeah, but Shane, uh, my duct tape's holding my carpet just fine. <laughs> and your case is the top of the glass is so scratched up they can't see in it. And your elements are old. And then you wonder why your volume's going down. I've been through three recessions and I've decided not to participate in any of them. <laughs> and did you know that Mercedes sales, Rolex sales, high-end ticket sales, and a whole lot of luxury items, and you see, when you work with the wealthy, you are selling luxury items. A lot of those sales didn't go down the last three years. Did not. State of mind. What's your state? You want to sell large ticket items? You want to be known for selling big pieces? You want to sell $100,000 diamonds? You want to sell high-end estate pieces? You want to be the professional in your community that's so awesome the other stores shut down? Wow. Teach your people how to close. Teach them how to romance. Be seen in the right civic organizations. Get large ticket items on people that go to the country club that's going to brag about you, that's going to give you a 90% closing ratio plus when the wealthy comes in because they want that same experience. Train your people how to talk about money while high ticket items. Teach them how to add on. Talk to them about proactive salesmanships, follow-up, phone calls, emails, texting, calling people six months to bring something in. Those are the things you got to do. Don't come here and listen to me and say, oh, that was good, and write it down on a piece of paper and go home and go up. Man, that was really some good stuff. And then don't do any of it. This doesn't do any good to come listen and say, oh, that's great. I can make all of you great if you take this home and start doing it. How's that? You guys willing to change? I can't hear you. Yes. All right. Who are you going to wow? Everybody. You going to teach your people how to close? Now, there's a lot of vendors here that have big diamonds. Don't say, oh, we can't afford them. Don't do that. You're becoming the cell killer. Memo some in. Put them in a museum case. Show them to people coming in. Let them know you have it. And when they're ready, because they know you have it, they're going to come see you. And they're not going to have to go to New York or Chicago because they know you have it. They know you don't have it. Change their opinion of you. Have it. Let them know you've got it. God bless all of you. Thanks for coming. Go tear it up.